Good morning, Wayside. You know, it is our correct response to come before God with thanksgiving and praise. Even in the midst of trials, we praise God because He is our help, our very present help in times of need. Psalm 98.4 says, Shout to the Lord all the earth. Break out in praise. Sing with joy. Would you stand with us and sing out as we do that this morning? Side. By the way, I'm, I'm supposed to be here this morning, so in case you're wondering. My name is John Gordon. I serve as one of the pastors here at Wayside, and whether you're seated here on the 410 campus or you're seated out there online, 
We are glad that you're here to worship the true and the living God with us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And if you're a guest with us this morning, either here or there, we want to know that you're with us. And one of the ways that you can help us do that is if you're here, you can access that card that's on the chair back in front of you. There's a QR code. Just scan that code and that's gonna pull up our online or app connection card. Uh, if you're seated out there, you can scan that code right there on your screen. And like I said, you can either do that online or you can use our Wayside app. And as our guests here on the 410 campus, at the conclusion of our service, I'm gonna be in the Welcome Center. It's an easy find right across the hall here from the sanctuary. I would love to meet you, address whatever questions you have about our church, and help you get connected here. You know, ministry continues. Uh, 2021 is behind us, 2022 has been off to a great start. Ministry has continued uninterrupted. And that is because of the faithful giving and praying of the congregation of you. And you've got five different ways that you can give. Use the one that is most convenient for you, but thank you for allowing the ministries here at Wayside to continue uninterrupted, even in the midst of this pandemic. And speaking of ministry continuing, we are hosting a marriage conference right here at Wayside next Saturday. The title of our conference is Marriage Matters. And if you're needing help in your marriage, of course I say that, who doesn't need help in their marriage? Or you're just wanting your marriage to be all that God intends it to be, Attend this Ma Marriage Matters conference next Saturday right here at Wayside, and you can sign up online to take advantage of that. That said, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Our God and our Father, it is with joyous and full hearts joyous hearts for the realization of what you have done for us through Christ Jesus our Lord. And full hearts that are full of the love for you and the love for those around us. That we come together today to worship your holy name. And Father, we recognize too that all of us are here with different things going on in our lives. I think of uh, Donna de Armand this morning and just the loss of her former husband and praying for their children, Dennis and Denise, that, Father, you would surround this family with your love and your care through the body of Christ. And, Father, as we worship together this morning, may you remind us of what Jesus has done for us that we could not do for ourselves. And Father, may our hearts be full of the joy of Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Now, I direct your attention to the baptistry. Well, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And here at Wayside, it's very important to make disciples and also baptize. And today I have two people coming, John and Crystal Camp, who were baptized as infants in the hope that one day they would trust Christ, which they've done. And now they seek baptism as adults by identifying with Christ in his death and then his resurrection. And so today, John and Crystal, it is my privilege to baptize each of you. So, John. We're going to go first here. John, have you trusted Christ? And yes. do you believe that he died for your sins and rose from the dead? Yes. John, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. 
raised to walk in newness of life. Crystal, have you trusted Christ, and do you believe that he died for your sins and rose from the dead? Yes. Well, my sister Crystal, based on your profession of Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Now, would you stand and continue worshiping with us today?
Well, when you hear the name Samson, what comes to mind? Is it a strong man with rippling muscles? Do you picture Delilah cutting his hair? Maybe some of you see him scooping honey out of a lion or maybe standing with the jawbone of a donkey over the Philistines he's slain. Still others will picture him as pushing over the pillars at the pagan feast. And all of those are accurate pictures of Samson, as we're going to see in the weeks ahead as we continue in the book of Judges. But while all those things are true, I wonder how many of us have ever thought of Samson as a little baby, a little baby with a quiet and a miraculous beginning. Because that's what we're going to see today as we turn in our Bible to Judges chapter 13. Now, as we look at the backdrop of Judges 13, we're going to see that it's anything but quiet. Because what is happening uh, during this time is verse 1 tells us, Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines forty years. Now, if you've been with us from the beginning of this series in the book of Judges, maybe you feel like the record player has been stuck uh, because we've seen this same sad verse repeated seven times now in the book of Judges. There are no details given here. What are the sins that Israel has committed? Well, we can look back earlier at Judges 10, 6 through 7, because there it says, Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord served the Baals and the Ashtoreth, the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the sons of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines. Thus they forsook the Lord, and they did not serve him. And the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the sons of Ammon. Now in chapters 11 through 12, you'll remember we saw where God raised up another deliverer, another judge by the name of Jephthah. And we saw how God brought about deliverance from Ammon through Jephthah. And now as we come to chapters 13 through 16, there will be another deliverance, this time from the enemy called the Philistines. And it comes through Samson. Now, the deliverance of Samson is going to be different than anything we've ever seen before. Because for one thing, Samson will be a one-man wrecking crew. All the other judges have had armies that have rallied around them. But Samson, as we're going to see, is one who is raised up and fights alone. In fact, when we get to chapter 15, we're going to see where the people turn on Samson and they hand him over to the enemy. Another thing that's different is that the land will never fully receive rest. As you look at verse 5, it says, and he shall begin He shall begin to deliver Israel. Now, I want you to understand this isn't a failure of God's power. Rather, what we see here is a failure of God's people to repent. It's a failure of repentance on the part of the people. As we've gone through Judges, we've seen this five-step cycle that takes place. You'll see where the people of Israel have sinned. And because of that, God sends them into this time of slavery or oppression. It's God's discipline in order to drive the people back to himself. As people suffer and they turn to God, they cry out uh, in supplication. They, they have this prayer of repentance where they call out to God and ask for his deliverance. And he responds by raising up a savior, a judge, who will be that man or woman who leads the nation uh, into a time of silence. There's peace and rest in the land. But then the people turn their back on God once again and they go back into this uh, time of slavery. And as we look here uh, at what we're reading in Judges chapter 13, there is, <clears throat> there is the, the first two things. We see in verse 1, there's sin, and then there's slavery. But as you keep reading this passage, you'll notice that the next step of supplication where the people cry out in repentance does not happen, which is why this time of oppression goes on for 40 years. That's the longest time of enemy occupation in the entire book of Judges. And when it comes to the the time of oppression, this too is different because if you look back at Judges 10.8, you see where the enemy afflicted and crushed the nation is how it's described there. The Ammonites uh, were crushing Israel. Back in chapters 10 through 12, we saw this happened on the eastern side of the Jordan. And as they felt that pain of the enemy occupation, they cried out in repentance to God. And that's where Jephthah was raised up. And he, he came in and he led the nation in battle. 
But what we're reading about here is on the western side of the Jordan. The land is divided by the Jordan River. And uh, the people are now on the western side suffering under the occupation of the Philistines. Now, the Philistines have done this before. Back in Judges 3.31, you remember that we saw Shamgar was another judge raised up at that time to defeat the Philistines. And we saw how the Philistines were attacking the nation. There were these raiding parties that were coming in and attacking the land. But as we come to chapter 13, it's 150 years later, 150 years after the time of Shamgar. And the Philistines are again oppressing the people. But this time... The oppression is different. They're they're not coming in and enslaving Israel through military dominance, but instead there's this spiritual and cultural seduction that we're going to see taking place. Now, it's not that the Philistines were too weak to win a battle militarily. They were a strong uh, nation, and they had the advantage of advanced weapons that Israel did not have, because if you read 1 Samuel 13, verses 19 through 21, It says, now no blacksmith could be found in all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines, each to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock, his axe, and his hoe. And the charge was two-thirds of a shekel for the plowshares, the mattocks, the forks, and the axes to fix the hoes. So what it's telling us is the Philistines uh, were the the military power of the day that also had control of all of the iron and the blacksmiths and those who worked with metal. And what they would do is they would creep in through compromise using trade and intermarriage to infiltrate and take over the people in the area. In chapter 14, we see that Samson himself will succumb to this because when we get there, we'll find that that he marries the Philistine woman. Israel was not being kept in bondage through uh, an iron fist of military occupation. Rather, it came through spiritual and cultural compromise. It's the proverbial frog in a kettle where if you put a a frog in in a pot of water and you slowly turn the heat up, the water can get to a boiling point and the frog never realizes it's in danger of being boiled to death. And it will just happily swim around in the water as it as it becomes uh, too hot and kills the frog. And this is what was happening with Israel. The game plan of the Philistines was to conquer them by compromise and assimilation so that they no longer were distinct from the pagan nations around them as they moved away from following the true God to the the pagan gods of the world. How, How much of this is what we see in our own day? As you look at society, as you look at our culture, Uh, what is happening to the church, what is happening to believers in terms of no longer being distinct from society around us. There are churches, there are whole denominations that are making compromises to fit in with the world. Uh, They're watering down the truth of the gospel. They're compromising on God's word. Uh, So many believers are more concerned about being politically correct than biblically correct. And as a result, the church is losing its influence. The church is losing its distinctiveness from the culture around us. Jesus warned about this. He said in Matthew 5, 13, excuse me, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. What we find here in Judges 13 is God's people were caving in. They were compromising. They said the world has things that we want and they were willing to uh, set aside following God to gain these things, access to metal, access to marriage uh, with the foreign wives around them. And these compromises came at a very high price. They set aside God for goods. They set aside their morals for marriage. Now, God could have abandoned them. God could have said, you've made your choices. You've you've chosen the things of the world. You've chosen to turn your back on me, so go and live that way. Go and suffer uh, under that. But instead of abandoning his people, God's great mercy is seen here because he intervenes by sending Samson. He didn't send Samson to bring a full deliverance because the people had not turned to God, but what he did was Samson served as a speed bump 
to slow down the Philistines, to slow down the compromises, to allow the people of Israel to realize what was happening and to turn back to God. Verse two tells us, and there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had borne no children. When we get to chapter 18, we're gonna see uh, this where the, the nation of Israel, if you'll put the slide up here with the, the map, that yellow arrow that you see at the very top is far north of the allotted tribes where the promised land was. And this is where the nation had been given the promised land and Dan had been given the territory down where that red arrow is. 15 miles outside of Jerusalem was this town of Zorah where we're reading that this man Manoah and his family were at. But the nation as a whole, uh, the tribe of Dan had moved all the way to the north and abandoned their allotment. Rather than stand against the enemy in the land, they just said, we're gonna take the easy route and they fled from where God wanted them. But Manoah and his wife were part of a faithful remnant of the Danites who had remained in the land that had been given to them. Verse two tells us this couple had a heart for God, but they also had a heartache because it says they were childless. Now, barrenness in the Hebrew culture was seen as the ultimate curse. People who were unable to have children were thought to have uh, God against them. And so you've got Manoah and his wife who were probably mocked. People said, oh, well, you're following Yahweh. You're, you're saying that he's the true God and you're serving him and he won't even give you children. And it, it was even worse when you remember that the pagan gods of the day uh, Baal, Astra, they were said to be the fertility gods. Remember, they were the gods who were worshiped, who were supposed to give fertility to the land and who were supposed to bless people with babies. And so the world was telling them, if you really want to be blessed, if you really want the things that your heart's desire is, well, then you should serve the, the pagan gods of the world instead of serving this God who won't come through for you. How many of us have seen similar things in society today? Or maybe you've been told, or you have family or friends who have been told, why are you serving God? Why are you following the God of heaven when he's doing nothing for you? Why do you go to church? Why do you give of your time and your talents and your treasures to a God who isn't coming through for you? But if you'll do the things that the rest of society says to do, if you'll follow the gods of the world, so to speak, you can have all the desires of your heart. You can have everything that the world offers you, all the pleasures that are out there. Manoah and his wife were being bombarded with these lies. But we see they didn't compromise. They didn't give in to the counterfeits of the world to get the, the passing pleasures that were cheap counterfeits that would ultimately leave them empty. Instead, they were faithful. They continued to serve God. <clears throat> and as we see in the next verses, God had not forgotten this couple and he was about to answer not only their desires, but also the needs of the nation. Because verses three through five tell us, and the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, behold now, you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and give birth to a son. Now therefore be careful not to drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing, for behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son. And no razor shall come upon his head, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines." Now, as Manoah's wife hears the news that she's gonna become pregnant, and through that pregnancy, God will deliver the nation uh, as he gives his protector to the people. She runs and shares the news with her husband. Verses six through seven tell us, then the woman came and told her husband, saying, a man of God came to me and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. And I did not ask him where he came from, nor did he tell me his name. But he said to me, behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son. And now you shall not drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. For the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Now you notice here that Manoah calls this man a messenger. A, he, this messenger, a man of God. Now that's a term that was often used of a prophet. 
And we see that she knows he's more than just a human prophet because she says that his appearance was like the appearance of an angel of God, very awesome. Later, the passage will describe how this angel of God uh, is offered a sacrifice and is the, the fire that comes down consumes not only the sacrifice, but also this messenger will go up into heaven in the smoke. And, and the result of that is they will realize this was more than an angel. This was what was called a theophany. It means a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. This was God's son himself coming to share the news. I mean, think about what an amazing moment that was. The savior of the world was delivering news that a savior was being given in order to release the people from this time of bondage. And as this news of the encounter is first shared with Manoah, look at his faith. He doesn't dismiss his wife as having been in the sun too long. Uh, rather, what he says in verse 12 is, now when, not if, he says, now when your words come to pass, what shall be the boy's mode of life and his vocation? What's he going to be when he grows up? The dad asks. There was a husband and a wife who were discussing this of their son. And they were trying to figure out, well, what's our boy going to be when he's grown up? And, and the husband tells his wife, he said, I think I know how we can find out. We can give this test to see what our son's going to be. And so they go into the kitchen and the, the father lays a $20 bill on the table. And he tells his wife, if our son takes the money, he's going to be a banker. He's going to go into the, the area of finance. And then he takes a Bible and he lays it on the table next to the $20 bill. And he says, now, if our son takes the Bible, he's going to be a preacher. He's going to devote his life to serving God and sharing his word. And lastly, he takes and puts a bottle of wine on the table. And he says, if our son takes this, he's going to be a bum. And then he said, let's hide and, and watch what our son does. So the, the man and his wife get in a place where they weren't seen and they're watching the kitchen. And soon enough, the son comes walking in. And as he enters the kitchen, he sees these items on the table. And he's kind of surprised. He looks them over and then he kind of looks around, makes sure nobody's around. And he walks over and he picks up the $20 bill. And he takes and he holds it up to the light. He kind of studies it, kind of uh, looks at it again, and he lays it back on the table. Next, he picks up the Bible. He starts flipping through it. He reads a, a passage or two, and the wife grabs her husband's arm and smiles and says, oh, I knew he was going to choose the Bible. He's going to be a preacher. And then he puts the Bible back down. Next, he picks up the bottle. He uncorks it, and he starts to sniff it. And the mom says, oh no, he's going to be a bum. But then he corks the bottle back, he sets it on the table, looking around the room one more time to make sure he's alone. In one sweeping motion, he picks up the $20 bill, stuffs it in his pocket. He picks up the Bible, puts it under his arm, and he grabs the bottle by the neck, and he walks out of the kitchen whistling. And the wife is confused, and she says to her husband, what does it mean? And the father goes, oh, he's going to be a politician. <laughs> you know, if there were some tests you could give to your kids to figure out what they'd be in life, wouldn't you want to know? I mean, as a parent, don't you want to know what your kids are going to be like? I mean, think about how many parents can't even wait nine months to figure out, is it going to be a boy or a girl? But we take a peek through a sonogram or something. Here, Manoah wants a peek into the future. He says, well, what will our son's life and vocation be? But no matter what the questions are that he asks, we see in the next verses that God says, there's no more information that's going to be given. He says, you don't need to know anything else. I've told you everything you need to know on how to raise your son. And what Manoah and his wife needed to do now was teach their son what God had said. What did the scripture say? How was he to follow God's word and the work that God was calling him to do? And as we're reading this, there's a point of application for us here because, friends, God has given us all the instructions we already need. If you're a parent, God has already told you 
what you need to do to raise your children. He tells us in Deuteronomy 6 to teach your children God's word, to teach your kids to love God, to love his word as parents and as grandparents. We have that privilege of instilling the knowledge of God's word. As parents, God has given us all the instructions we need. He's told us in Ephesians 5 that as parents, we're not to exasperate our children. We are to love them and discipline them, but we're not to overrun them. In God's word, he's told us what we need, not just in how to raise our children. He tells us what our home is to look like, how as husbands and wives, we're to love one another and how, how we're to serve one another. He tells us what our life is to look like at work, how we're to relate uh, to the government in authority over us in the day in which we live. Every bit of instruction for life is already given to us right here in God's word. He says you and I don't need anything more than what he's already revealed to us. Follow and live according to all I've already told you. In verses 13 through 14, it tells us, so the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, let the woman pay attention to all that I said. She should not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor nor drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. Let her observe all that I commanded. You know, this is the third time these instructions are repeated showing just how important what is being said is. I want you to remember the context of what's happening, where Israel is compromising, where Israel is becoming like the nations around them, living just like the pagans of the world. And so God is emphasizing how they are to be set apart, how they are not to be assimilated. As a Nazarite, Samson would stand in stark contrast to all that he and his family were were exposed to in the world around them. Their assignment was not to whisk their child off to some secluded location to isolate from the world. Rather, they were to raise him in the context of that culture, but living in such a way that people would look and say, why is Samson different? Why are you different? The Hebrew word nazir means to separate or consecrate. And this is what a Nazarite was. It was a person who was set apart set apart to God, consecrated, designated to be one who would live differently, live for God in the world around them. And there are many things we find in the scriptures as to what a Nazarite was to do or not do. One is they were never to touch uh, the carcass of anything that was dead or considered ceremonially unclean. He was not to drink wine, nor eat grapes, or even raisins, as you can see by reading Numbers chapter 6, verse 4. It's not that there was something wrong about the fruit of the vine. It was seen as a luxury at one level, and it also, again, just would show a commitment to being set apart. Another sign of being set apart was he, he was not to cut his hair. He wasn't to cut his hair. Now, kids today love to hear that, right? Uh, you've got... You've got uh, what we call the COVID cut going on right now, where so many people for years couldn't even get into a barber and and kids have started to, you know, grow their hair out. I've got a 16 year old son and, uh, you know, my mom, his, his mom, my wife is always saying, I think he needs a haircut. And Zach's like, no, no, my hair's great. It's fine. Um, There was a a teenage son who was uh, arguing with his parents about getting his hair cut and, uh, The boy had just gotten his license. And so he said, well, I want to drive the car. Can I take the car and, you know, kind of go out? And and the father said, son, I'll make a bargain with you. He said, "Uh, I've noticed that your grades haven't been very good lately. And he said, I've also noticed you're not really reading the Bible. I really think you should be spending more time in God's word. And finally, you know, your mom and I think you need need to get a haircut. Uh, And so he said, I'll tell you what. If you bring your grades up, if you start studying the Bible and you get a haircut, you can take the car. Now, a month passed and the boy came back with his report card and he gave it to his dad and his dad looked it over and he had, he had brought his grades up considerably and the father said, son, I'm proud of you. You've, you've done really well. Your grades are looking really good. And he said, and dad, I've been reading my Bible too. And he said, as I've read the Bible, he said, you know what I found? is there, there were men in the Bible like Samson and John the Baptist who were Nazarites. They didn't get their hair cut either. And he said, so dad, I've chosen not to get my hair cut. 
And the father said, well, son, I can see you've been reading your Bible. That's true. He said, but there's one thing you missed about those guys too. They walked everywhere they went. (laughs) You know, Samson had been called to live a life set apart to God. And in that day, long hair was said to be the crown of a woman. It was, it was a sign of her, her, her beauty. And men in that day typically did not have long hair that had been uncut for a long time, like uh, Rapunzel in the movie Tangled. And so when you had a guy like Samson walking around with this flowing mane of hair, people would have noticed. They, they, they would have said, why, why are you different? The guidelines here were not about legalism or ritual. Rather, it was, again, an outward sign that says this person has been set apart. John the Baptist, you'll remember, wore uh, coarse clothing and he ate locusts and honey and things because as a Nazarite, he too was living different than the world around him and people noticed. And as Samson lived that way, it would make him stand out just as God wanted his people to stand out to be different than the world around them. As you think about your own life today, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you and I have been called to be set apart, sanctified. The word sanctified means to be set apart. And it's not so that we can run around and and say we're holier than others. Rather, it's designed that if our lives live in contrast to those around us, people will look at us and say, you're different. Why are you different? What is it that you have that I don't have? Because as we live lives that are different, it'll stand in contrast to the the society around us. And there are positive ways as well. People will look at us and say, why do you have this peace When so much of the world is in turmoil right now with COVID and other things, why why are you able to, to have this assurance that others don't have right now in the world in which we live? And we're able to then share about this foundation of faith that we have. The Bible describes how when the storms of life hit, that a house built on shifting sand will collapse. But if it's been built on the rock, it says the wind and the waves of the storm will hit and that house will stand. And as believers in Christ, as we live for him, as we reflect Christ in the compromises of the world in which we live, people will look and say, why are you different? What do you have that others do not have? Most of us have seen or heard of the, the Amish. Here's, here's a picture of an Amish buggy in the middle of a metropolitan area. And if you've seen much of the, the Amish or the Mennonites, uh, they're, they're conservative Mennonites who have separated themselves from the 20th century lifestyle around. Now, their, their lifestyle has become more of a cultural curiosity to many. We see things like that buggy. We see the way they dress. We, we hear about them living off the grid without electricity and other things. And, and their, their lifestyle is a specific cultural way of life that unfortunately does not influence the culture for Christ. Because what they've done is they've withdrawn from society to the point where they are so separate. They've gone so far to the separation side that they don't impact others for Christ. And thus they fail at the very mission that they say that they're there upholding, being different than the world around them. God has given us a mission as believers to be salt and light in the world. Salt and light. And when it comes to being a believer who is set apart, it doesn't mean isolated. Jesus Christ said this in John 17, 15 through 17. I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them. There's that word again. Set them apart. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. You see, we've been sent into the world to be salt and light. You all have salt shakers in your house. They're filled with salt. And that salt does nothing if it remains in the salt shaker. It has to be sprinkled out. And when you sprinkle it out on food, it it enhances the flavor. It's a preservative against decay. 
And as believers, we've been called to leave the salt shaker and to get into the world. We've been called to be in the world, but not of the world. When I was in seminary, I, I worked as a policeman in Dallas. I worked my way through, through seminary as a cop on the streets of Dallas. So I know it's easy for some to say, well, Roger, you're just a pastor. You don't understand the world. You don't understand what I face in my job. No, I do. Before I was a pastor, I was a policeman. And before that, I worked in uh, construction and retail and a number of other jobs. I've been out in the world and, and I understand what it's like to try to live for Christ, to be different and set apart in the context of where you find yourself. When I was uh, going through seminary and as a cop, I had a lot of nicknames in the police department, Reverend Raj, pastor with a pistol, uh, you know, they weren't always meant as terms of endearment. Uh, some of the fellow officers I worked with used them as names to mock me in my faith because I tried to live differently. Again, not holier than thou, I just tried to be different. And there were some who would criticize me and mock me uh, for my faith. But you know what I found is, when things got really hard, when their marriages were a mess, when something happened at work where an officer was uh, killed in the line of duty, when other things happened and those questions of what's next, what happens when our life is over, they would come to me and they would ask a lot of questions about God, about my faith. They would ask the watch commander, hey, can you assign me with Roger so I can ride eight hours in a car uh, with him and talk uninterrupted? There were others who said, hey, can we go out after work and get a beer and uh, talk about my marriage or my kids or problems I'm facing in life? And I could have said, because I was in seminary, in seminary at Dallas at the time, I had to sign a statement that said I, I would not drink or smoke or do things like that. Uh, there was a code of conduct that students had to have. And I could have very easily said, well, I, I'm sorry, I signed this statement that I, I, you know, I can't drink, so uh, I won't meet you at a bar, but if you want to come to church with me, we'll talk about God and life there. And that would have been comfortable for me, but not for them. So what I did instead was say, fine, sure. Love to go out after work with you. And I'd go sit in a bar with them. And while they were drinking a beer, I'd get a Dr. Pepper. And we'd talk. And I'd sit there and I'd breathe secondhand smoke for two hours to try to keep them from breathing smoke for all eternity, right? <laughs> because if I could help them to start a relationship with Jesus Christ, it was worth it. Friends, you can be set apart and it doesn't mean you're isolated. Now, as I say that, I want you to use wisdom. Uh, there were times some of these officers I worked with said, hey, let's go to a topless bar. And I didn't say, oh, that's great, let's go. There are times you have to be uh, set apart. That would have been bad for my witness. It would have been bad for me as a person. I have a sin nature. I don't need those kind of temptations. If you're somebody who struggles with alcoholism, if you have a family history or you struggle yourself and your coworker says, hey, let's go get a beer, don't do that. That's not good for you. Use wisdom. When I'm telling you to be in the world but not of the world, you have to use wisdom. You have to use discretion. Pray to God. Ask him to help you understand where are those places. Think of where God has you. At school, at work, in the military, in your neighborhoods, all the places that God has put you. You have an opportunity to be salt and light right where you are. And so ask yourself, are you being a lighthouse and a witness for Christ where God has you? There's a fellow pastor named Gary Enrig, and he says, some Christians understand separation the way Samson did. They live by a strict code, where if you were to ask them, are you a separated Christian? They would say, of course I am. I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't go there. Friends, that's not the separation God wants from us. God doesn't want us to be isolated. He calls us to be in the world, but not of the world. Think of a lifeboat. A boat is designed to be in the water. But if you get too much of the water in the boat, it sinks. And as believers, we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. Like a lifeboat, we're to be out there helping to rescue others. But we're to be careful not to be immersed in the world. 
We're to maintain our distinction as disciples of Christ. Romans 12, 2 tells us, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Friends, we live in a time like Samson's, where compromise and tolerance are, are the rules of the day, but God has called us to be salt in these dark times. And as he said in Matthew, but if salt has lost its saltiness, it's worthless. As we seek to live our lives for God, I wanna remind you that he hasn't left us to do it on our own. I told you that Samson would be a one-man wrecking crew, but he wasn't out there on his own. He had been given the gift of God's help. If you look at Judges 13, 25, it says, and the spirit of the Lord began to stir him. As Christians, we too have been given the gift of God's spirit. You can read John chapter 14 and verses 16 through 17. It says, and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. As we look at the world around us, friends, I know it can be discouraging. You can look at society, you can see uh, the, the slide, you know, downward slide of compromise that's happening all around, but I wanna remind you that God is at work. God is not without a witness in the world. You and I who are believers in Christ are part of his witness to the world. We have been called to be light in the world, to be his representatives. Our passage ends in verse 24 by saying, then the woman gave birth to a son <clears throat> and named him Samson. And the child grew up and the Lord blessed him. The name Samson literally means sunny or brightness. And he brought light into the world. He brought joy into the life of his parents who wanted this child. But more importantly, he became a light to Israel during the dark days he was in. And for those of us who are believers in Christ, God has given us the same assignment today. A moment ago, we read in Matthew 5, 13, if salt loses its saltiness, it's no good for anything. The verses right after that say in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. No one hides their light under a basket, but puts it on a lampstand to give light. So let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Will you join me as we go to God in prayer and ask him to help us to do that? Lord God, you call us as your people to be salt and light. Would you help us, Father, to leave the salt shaker, to go out into the world around us, where we can help to enhance and preserve just as salt does. Father God, we know that the days are getting darker. We know that the world around us is, is broken. We know there is compromise. We know, God, there are many who are turning from you. But that just means that the light we shine in the darkness will be that much brighter, that much more pronounced. So God, would you help us to be men and women, boys of girls of courage who know Christ, who have the gift of your spirit in us. And may we be those who are your light to the dark and dying world around us. We pray these things in the name of our savior, Jesus Christ, amen. There are prayer leaders here at the front. If you have a need, we'd love to pray with you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Have a great Sunday.